Hey, everybody. This is Ed Friedman. Um, I chair Friends of Mary Meany Bay. Thank you all for coming. And uh, I want to thank Martin McDonough for being on the tech side of things here at our end. And uh, of course, our speaker, Al, and his wife, Sandy, uh, on, at their end. Um, I'm going to run through a, a, a few slides about who we are at Friends of Mary Meany Bay, what we do. Um, uh, tell you a couple of things that just happened and then introduce our speaker. Friends of Mary Vinnie Bay is a unique organization in that we, we, are, we take a holistic look at things and, and we, do, we combine research, uh, hardcore advocacy, uh, land conservation and education in, in, in our program work. A um, few slides here of, of different things we, we do. Um, you know, research. We've done a great circulation study at Bay. Uh, this cutting edge uh, uh, ditto for the using cage mussels to um, <clears throat> to look at toxins, locate the hotspot for dioxin uh, uh, and PCBs. Um, we do nest surveys every year for bald eagles. Um, the aerial vegetation and land use study. First time anyone had ever done that, looking at historical. Uh, data, bringing it into the present and combining those and looking at changes over time. And I'm clicking here. Advocacy, again, our, our <clears throat> generally our research um, informs our advocacy. A lot of it's around fish passage, <clears throat> dam removals and stuff. You can see this poor female eel who's out migrating, who got munched by the turbines up here. Uh, same thing for the the alewife here, river herring. We often posted uh, posted rivers for fish consumption advisories. An active education program, not as active right now as it's been because of COVID, um, but combination of outdoor programs, hands-on with bay days, indoor schools, hands-on there, uh, taking in a lot of taxidermy critters to schools and you know programs like this. And again, we are a land trust, we protected you know well over 1,500 acres of land by now. Our focus is not on recreation, but on uh, protecting valuable wildlife habitat. Just protected another 35 acres um, towards the tail end of this last year along the Kennebec River. <clears throat> if you um, if you have friends who couldn't make it tonight or want to look at any of our um, older recorded uh, presentations, um, while our presentations go back for like 26 years, we've been recording them for at least 10. Or at least that's what's up on the web. If you go down the right side of our homepage under education, you'll see a, a link here for speaker series video <clears throat> list. And um, we should have this one posted within a couple of days or so. Uh, the calendar for this year and the, the, the next couple here. Uh, these are on the, with extremely rare exceptions, the second Wednesday of each uh, month. Um, between October and or October through May. And this next one will be interesting in April, uh, agroacoustics. You know, we walk everywhere, we're out in the field doing stuff, and we, you know, listen, we hear the eagles squeal or cry or birds sing or what have you, um, and we uh, kind of look up, but we very seldom think about the community that's underfoot, literally. And there's a lot of communication going on there and a lot of sound. And Louise Roberts uh, has done a lot of work, acoustic work with what's going on subsoil. And she's gonna, she's gonna be joining us late night for her from the University of Liverpool in the UK and talking about that other world. So before I introduce Al, um, I'm just gonna mention that uh, kind of coincidentally, yesterday I was up testifying in Augusta um, or as we fondly call it, Disgusta, when we have to go to the legislature and, and uh, uh, testifying on a study bill to look at uh, effects of radio frequency radiation on uh, env the environment and on people. And I mentioned this because I know there's a lot of people on the, on the program tonight who are interested in the subject. And one of the things I said to the legislators is that, you know, often people get kind of poo-pooed when they claim they're sensitive or having issues around radio frequency stuff and electricity. And I pointed out to them that we are beings of frequency. We are really not a whole lot more than a bunch of charged subatomic particles, protons and electrons zooming around. And that's literally what holds us together. Um, that and a bunch of water. 
And so, you know, we've had billions of years to evolve that delicate balance that keeps us, that lets us live and keeps us alive. And the really odd thing would be if we weren't affected by what are relatively recent and often much stronger um, um, frequencies that are man-made, whether from a smart meter, whether from power lines, you know, whatever. And then I, I pointed out as an example that, uh, you know, why we know this or partly why we know this and why it's true is that these particular frequencies very specific frequencies and specific power densities are also used for therapeutic purposes. And I mentioned a few, um, whether it's, you know, help in limb regeneration or, or uh, you know, transcranial work, um, you know, your paddles when you have a heart attack. Uh, and coincidentally, I heard this morning that uh, earlier today on public radio on NPR, uh, Terry Gross on Fresh Air had a program where she talked to a woman named Sally Addy, or Addy, who just wrote a book called We Are Electric. And the program was all about the use of manipulating the use of body electricity um, for, for medical purposes. And that was actually on earlier today. I thought it wasn't on until tonight, but um, it is on the web. So you may want to take a look at it. It's kind of interesting that it's on the same evening as, um, as our program tonight. So... So with that, um, I'm gonna give a, a somewhat long introduction for Al. Um, uh, he served as a senior lecturer, and he ser serves actually a senior lecturer and adjunct professor for the Advanced Academic Programs, Environmental Sciences, Sciences and Policy Division at Johns Hopkins University for 22 years now, teaching classroom and field classes in ecology, terrestrial and marine e uh, conservation biology, wildlife management. Additionally, he served as a branch chief. He's now retired as the senior wildlife biologist for the Division of Wild uh, Migratory Bird Management, Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, for 17 years, and as their national lead on anthro anthropocentric causes uh, of bird mortality from structures, including impacts from radiation, collision, and electrocution. Um, Manville chaired the Communication Tower Working Group, a wind turbine working group, and a, and a water bird bycatch working group, co-chaired the interagency seabird working group, represented the service on the wildlife work group on the National Wind Coordinating Collaborative on the Avian Power Line Interaction Committee, was technical science advisor to the Wind Energy Federal Advisory Committee and was the services technical advisor to the Bird Safe Glass Working Group. Al holds a BS in zoology and MS natural resources and wildlife management, and a PhD in wildlife ecology and management. He has studied and handled over 100 black bears, assessed brown bear human interactions in Alaska, conducted six summers of field research in the Aleutian Islands on the impact of marine debris on seabirds, sea lions, and seals, and studied impacts of the Exxon Valdez oil spill on seabirds for five years. Manville has served, also served as executive director of the Adirondack Mountain Club, a member of the steering committee for the Endangered Species Coalition. And in 1999, he received the Conservation Service Award from Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt for his bird conservation efforts with the electric utility industry. Al's testified over 40 times before Congress and related bodies. He conducted numerous research, research efforts globally published more than 175 professional and popular papers, chapters and book reviews, and given more than 160 invited presentations. And I should mention that he and his wife, Sandy, and their dogs are also friends of Merry Meeting Bay members. Now that they're living in Maine. Last but not least. So um, thank you, Al. We really appreciate you, uh, you coming and your support team there. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and We'll hand it over to you and we'll go from there. And I for, did forget to mention, if people have questions along the way, please put them in your uh, chat box, which is wherever your toolbar is, uh, in, in your chat, uh, in the chat room, I guess, uh, off your toolbar. And then we will kind of try and moderate some of those at the end. Thank you. Take it away, Al, as they okay. say. 
So I stopped sharing. So you need to start sharing. Okay. So, and then you'll need to go to play there. Okay. And I'm going to mute myself here. Yeah. Once you get going. Doesn't seem to want to. So hit hit play, and then you should have a full screen there. There we go. Okay. There you go. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Ed, for inviting me, and uh, thank you, Martin, for coordinating the uh, IT logistics of this presentation. Much appreciated. Um, let me jump right in here. So I'm going to talk about uh, my involvement with birds and bats, um, primarily with Fish and Wildlife Service, but also with Defenders of Wildlife, and then. Uh, somewhat with Johns Hopkins uh, over the years. And uh, so let's jump right in and talk about uh, the importance of birds. So, um, and how do we, can we move that over so I can, let's see, we, so I can actually see the full slides. Oh, this, okay, these, fine, the, yeah. Oh, can you? Me, Sorry, the yeah. IT department here to, is having a little trying to minimize the uh, so I can get the benefits of uh, well. Let me just I'll, I'll that's okay. We'll do deal with this. So anyway, let's talk about why birds are important. Um, they eat prodigious quantities of insect pests. Uh, it's estimated 400 to 500 metric tons per year of of insects. So think of like army cutworm moths or uh, gypsy moths or tent caterpillars or whatever, that take a lot of those to, to collect 400 to 500 metric tons of these. So they're very important from that perspective. Martins, swallows, warblers, others uh, consume huge quantities of disease carrying mosquitoes and other insect vectors. Some birds serve as pollinators. Uh, others scavenge weed seeds. Others cache seeds that uh, can grow into native trees and shrubs, like like the Clark's nutcracker, which caches seeds of the white bark pine. That's a, that's a tree that's very in in serious trouble from climate change and and uh, pine bark beetle infestations in the West. Others uh, uh, scavenging raptors. These are our cleanup crews, our garbage cans out in the roads. They remove road kills and infected wildlife that may contain rabies or tuberculosis, West Nile virus, or other diseases. Rodent control, study done in Lodi, California, uh, 18 pairs of barn owls were uh, observed to, to remove over 25,000 rodents over a two year period. So pretty impressive. And then from a standpoint of just human involvement, um, it's an estimated 50 million adult Americans feed birds. More than 16 million of us travel to watch birds and we spend something like $1.4 billion on equipment and spend $4 billion per year on bird food. So about one in four adult Americans watch or feed or photograph birds and more people bird watch than play golf. And sorry, Tiger Woods, but that's, that's the way it goes. So anyway, it's a, it's a, they're very important. And it's not wanting to advance. Oh, here we go, okay. So what are some of the, uh, the issues that affect birds? Well, there's predation, parasites, disease, and of course, um, Maine Calling this Monday had a piece on uh, avian influenza H5N1 here in Maine, where they talked about bald eagles and hooded mergansers uh, being infected and several hundred seals that had died from uh, um, the, the avian influenza. A uh, piece in the Atlantic Journal in February, which is very eye-opening. Uh, they also suffer accidents, starvation, drought, competition, stress, nutrient deficiencies, and so on. So a lot of things affecting them. On top of that, we have generally human-related causes of mortality, things like climate change, pesticides, poisoning, contaminants, oil spills, oil pits, loss and degradation of habitat, invasion of species, hunting, poaching, additive mortality, and domestic and feral cats. This is the biggest one. Uh, it's estimated uh, about 2.4 billion, with a B, birds are killed per year in the United States by cats, um, predominantly feral cats, but also domestic cats. Uh, so that's huge. The second biggest impact is from collisions with building windows. Uh, then we have structural caused impacts. 
collisions with cell towers, TV towers, commercial wind turbine blades, power transmission and distribution lines, um, lights, uh, industrial solar arrays, aircraft, bridges, fences, gas flares, um, uh, cattle uh, watering tanks, uh, other, other structures. Electrocutions, these are primarily from power distribution infrastructure. So these are the things that bring the power into our house, uh, off the transmission line, through the neighborhood, and then it usually goes into a transformer and is it's stepped down to 220 volts and then comes into the house. So electrocutions are primarily a result of, of improper uh, design and, and placement and so on of these structures. Transmission power stations also will electrocute some birds. Uh, electromagnetic frequency radiation is another impact. Entanglement and bycatch with fishing gear. So all these sources of mortality are what we call cumulative. Add them all up and they create some huge problems. So this is analogous to a death by a thousand cuts. We do know that birds are in serious trouble. <clears throat> of our 1,154 species of birds in North America, fully one third of them are in need of urgent conservation action. So um, these things that are happening to them now are, are very troubling. We have collisions with communication towers. I estimated um, several publications, four to five million per year communication towers in this country. Um, uh, in a publication I was involved with, with Travis Longcore at Al, uh, we estimated 6.8 million birds killed in the U.S. and Canada with communication power pollutants, the majority of which are in the U.S. And then in another paper, we, we projected and estimated uh, through a meta review that 13 species of birds of conservation concern, these are birds that are in trouble, they're declining, some precipitously, but they're not yet ready for listing under the Endangered Species Act, or being impacted solely by collisions with communication towers affecting at a population level, these species. So this is very troubling. Uh, communication or collisions with, with commercial land-based wind turbines. I did an estimate in 2009 of 440,000. And then in, uh, and I can't read the date here because the picture is ahead of it, but, but uh, John Smallwood published it, I think it was like 2013, 573,000 based on an increase in the number of what we call installed capacity more turbines were built and, and operating on the, on the land front. Then we have collisions with commercial offshore wind turbines. Now we don't have any data here in the US yet. Uh, we've got sites that have been approved for, for testing here in Maine waters, but the concerns that, that we have that are dealing with this are impacts from Northern gannets. These are plunge diving birds that could be impacted by the turbine blades, sea ducks, loons, common eiders, and other migratory birds. Also migrating bats that, that are uh, in their movements go out over the ocean could very easily be impacted by these, these uh, commercial offshore wind turbines. And then of course, the, the whole issue with, with the critically endangered Atlantic right whales, um, noise from, from these uh, structures and um, the impacts of ships going out to, to maintain the, uh, um, the wind turbines once they're built. Collisions with power distribution and transmission lines. Uh, I estimated uh, about 174 million per year. Um, collisions with industrial solar facilities or power towers, uh, such as in Ivanpah, South, Southern California. We don't have any systematic uh, numbers yet. Uh, in fact, that we don't even have any protocols for, for monitoring that I'm aware of, but there were a few hundred documented when we first started to look into these issues. And then electrocutions primarily with distribution lines from about 900,000 to 11.6 million. So again, a lot of things happening to birds uh, that are rather troubling. Second largest figure for, for collision uh, are collisions with windows, buildings, glass, and the effects of lighting. Dan Clem and his team estimated from 365 million to 988 million with a medium about, uh, I can't read the figure here, but somewhere in between there, uh, are killed per year in collisions with, with uh, window structures. So this is, this is huge. And uh, over 50% of the birds that strike a window um, end up dying, uh, broken neck or broken wing or whatever. Um, bycatch with commercial fishing gear and fishing lines. Uh, we only have 
few site specific evidence uh, and uh, documentation available. Uh, the cumulative impacts are unknown. I might mention that when I worked for Defenders of Wildlife, I uh, was the uh, environmental representative on the High Seas Driftnet Fisheries Research Committee, where we were negotiating with the Japanese, Taiwanese, South Koreans, and the Canadians on trying to ban high seas drift nets worldwide, which we did in the United Nations. There, we estimated very back of the envelope, maybe 100,000 birds uh, per year were being killed in the, in the Pacific Ocean by entanglement with, with this gear. And then the effects of non-thermal, non-ionizing radiation, EMF. Um, We've had a few studies where we have uh, a, a little bit of mortality uh, uh, information available, but, but it's difficult to, to reliably quantify um, with statistical certainty uh, what's actually going on here. So we need some more work on this, this front. However, I want to footnote this, that we have a huge amount of information that our two senior authors, Blake Levitt and Dr. Henry Lai, um, me as the junior author, just published a um, three-part paper in reviews in environmental health in 2021. That's what I refer reference there. And um, a um, perspective paper published last year in Frontiers uh, in Environmental Health, uh, which are, these are all available publicly. Two areas that were a wake-up call for me as far as the radiation issues. Uh, Ted Litovich gave a congressional briefing in 2000 on their studies. Uh, at Catholic University on uh, cell phone radiation on chicken embryos. And they found that as little as one ten thousand, the, the level of radiation coming from the cell phones on a two hour exposure of chicken embryos resulted in some of those embryos dying from heart attacks as a result of stress protein um, um, impacts to the, to the embryos. The controls were unaffected. And then the other, one was a field study that Alphonse Balmori uh, uh, published. I was working with him, so got some good feedback on what was going on. He, uh, he looked at what were the effects of cell towers in Spain and where they, before the cell towers were put in, the, the birds were perfectly healthy, breeding um, very, very prolifically. These were um, white storks and um, uh, pigeons and, uh, um, um, English sparrows and what have you. And then once the cell towers went in, he noticed that uh, there were all sorts of aberrations. Birds were, they stopped breeding or they, the survivorship was much reduced. Storks breeding within 600 feet or so of the, of the uh, cell towers, the chick survivorship was zero. And uh, he noted feather deformities and even deaths in some of the birds. So this was a real wake up call for me. And, and uh, I really jumped into this and then got more involved uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service. So some of the structures that we were talking about tonight, building glass and lighting. So here's a, a top left is a peregrine falcon flying between these, these mirrored glass uh, uh, windows and these high rise uh, structures. Um, they can easily run into that, but the birds, the dead birds here, the songbirds to the right, are a portion of one night's kill of the birds that have collided with windows such as that. Um, the middle, top middle are standards, in this case, San Francisco uh, standards for best management practices for making bird safe buildings. Um, a number of cities have these. This uh, L810 light on the right here, this red light, these are the things that I'll mention in a minute. Uh, we've gotten the FCC to eliminate uh, from, from towers uh, and so on. They are steady burning and meaning they're on all the time and they attract birds and they're deadly. Also steady burning white lights are, 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 are also deadly uh, as well. Um, the uh, building in the bottom right, the message here is turn your lights out at night. Uh, these just become a killing field for birds, particularly migrating birds that uh, will come in, they think it's clear airspace, they're attracted to the lights and they hit the windows and, and often die. Uh, one way to deal with the issue is fretted or etched glass. Uh, middle bottom here is a, a glass pane that, that has been etched. Uh, birds see this and it makes it much more visible. And then the chart here in the left is 
just sort of give you an idea of the general um, magnitude of, of mortality to birds from different structures. And it, admittedly, it's, it's a little bit biased because it was um, Wally Erickson did this for the wind industry and they certainly wanna show that there's minimal impact on wind turbines on birds. So um, he put this up, but it, it's a little misleading because it doesn't tell the whole story. And the, the take of golden eagles by wind turbines in the West is, is much, much larger. It's disproportionately larger than the overall killing of, of birds from wind turbines. Uh, the cats issue also here is now out of date. Cats are uh, far rather than, you know, a thousand per 10,000. Uh, the, the median number I mentioned was 2.4 billion uh, birds killed by cats, uh, as opposed to up to not quite a billion uh, at building glass and windows and lighting issues. So uh, again, but it, it gives you a relative perspective of what's going on. So jumping to the next subject, bats. And I would say bats are unfortunately much maligned by a number of people and entities. Um, and they're not deserving of, of, of that, uh, of the attacks, but they are, however, very important. Two types of bats, basically. We have um, mega chiroptera, the, the um, flying foxes, the, the fruit-eating bats of, the, uh, of Asia, Africa, and the Latin Americas, and, and a few other places. And then the micro chiroptera, the uh, often insect-eating bats. And these are the ones that are critically important. So uh, the benefits of, of insect control to agribusiness and forest production. The ranges are, are, are amazing. And I can't read the actual numbers. I think it's like from um, 0.9 or 1 point something billion to $53 billion per year just in insect control. So they are incredibly important. The insectivorous bats may eat their weight in insects per night. So little brown bat may eat uh, a thousand insects or more in just one night. So they're great, great uh, insect controllers. They can remove disease carrying insects, including those carrying, uh, carrying malaria, dengue fever, um, uh, West Nile virus, uh, Zika, yellow fever, and certainly others. They're important as pollinators, particularly the, the uh, fruit eating bats. So just think of, of mangoes and bananas and, and guava and agave, your source of your tequila. Without, without bats, uh, we'd be in real serious trouble. Some bats disperse seeds. Others are indicators of biodiversity and ecosystem health. In fact, I'd say probably virtually all of them are. And they can be huge tourist attractions. At the Congress Street Bridge in Austin, Texas, or at Bracken Cave in, in Texas, um, this is huge for ecotourism, uh, seeing that at the, at, particularly at uh, Congress Bridge, the Mexican free-tailed bats when they come out at night from uh, their roosts uh, under the bridge during the daytime. <clears throat> Diseases. So one of the most deadly diseases right now, <clears throat> excuse me, is white nose, white nose syndrome. This is a, a fungal disease that affects the bats, uh, particularly in their hibernacula and little browns, Indianas, northern long-eared bats, tricolored bats. Uh, these can have devastating results and impacts on the populations, particularly northern long-eared bats. There are currently 12 species of bats that are affected by this, this uh, virus, uh, this, this uh, fungus. And what happens is in the, in the hibernaculum, the, for some reason, the, the fungus wakes the bats up, they become active, they burn their fat reserves, they fly around, and then they end up starving or freezing to death. So we've seen with, with uh, some of the colonies uh, up to virtually 100% loss of, of, of bats from, from white nose syndrome. Um, they also carry rabies, salmonella, and other diseases can affect them. They're also vectors of zoonotic diseases, for example, uh, histoplasmosis. And uh, it's been asserted that, that bats or pangolins are the source of COVID-19, still up for debate. And this is a result of clear cutting that we're doing in the tropical forests, certainly climate change, bushmeat trade, and the wet markets. Other causes of death, pesticides and contaminants, habitat destruction, alteration, hunting, predation accidents. You can see the slides here. And commercial wind turbine collisions, 
um, and with the blades and occasional collisions with communication towers. And then we have the whole issue of injury and death from electromagnetic frequencies, uh, which is difficult to show cause and effect, but bats avoid radar installations. Uh, they are highly sensitive to EMF through issues like reduced foraging, impacts to, to breeding, um, to um, migration. Uh, their magnetoreception capabilities are disrupted. Uh, bats, like many animals, including us, have magnetite in our, in our heads, and uh, this is affected. And we, we in our um, paper 2021, we go into considerable detail. Um, we've we've uh, basically reviewed over a thousand papers and uh, detailed what we know about the impacts. It's the most comprehensive uh, uh, paper, three-part paper yet, yet published. At any rate, um, more about bats and, and um, collisions with turbine blades. So they frequently occur at slow speeds. So the blades can be moving at like nine to 15 miles an hour. Um, this is slightly above what we call the cut-in speed for the blades, but it can be deadly. And cut-in speeds are the, are the speed about eight to 10 miles per, or eight to nine miles per hour, where the blade actually begins to, to um, cut into the wind and connect to the power grid, uh, producing at this point only small amounts of electricity. Even at these low speeds, um, when the bats are flying around and the insects are there, uh, they can, in their efforts to, to forge the insects, be killed by the blades. They suffer two impacts from, from blades. One is blunt force trauma, where they actually are hit by the blades, and the other is barotrauma, due to these pressure gradients that are created from the blade vortices, which rupture the lungs of the, of the bats, killing or disabling them. <clears throat> and then collisions and barotrauma can even occur at these low cut-in speeds uh, that I mentioned, uh, which, by the way, also can impact songbirds. 2009 study by the Wildlife Society estimated that 888,000 bats die in collisions uh, per year with, with wind turbines in the US. This is astounding. And the current estimate by the University of Colorado is about 600,000 bat deaths per year, but this, this estimate is probably conservative. And then this mortality is compounded by the slow reproductive rates of bats. They're just one pup per year, and it may take them several years before they breed, depending on the species. Hoary bats are one of the most impacted by blades. And to date, overall, we have 47 species of North American bats that are facing serious threats, and many are declining. And this is based on the Forest Service and US Geological Survey reports I've indicated here. So a little bit more about bat collisions. Uh, think of a, I don't know if, how many of you have actually seen operating industrial wind turbines, but these things are huge. And they can take up uh, the acreage equivalent to a football field uh, in what's called the rotoswept area. And at normal operating speeds, these blades are moving about 100 miles per hour. It doesn't look like it when you look at them uh, out of, uh, from a distance. They're just sort of like, ah, oh, they're just moving around. If you get fairly close to them, you realize, holy mackerel, this thing's really moving. And they can, they can spin up to 180 miles per hour. So they create huge wind wake turbulence and blade tip vortices. So there are pressure gradients that, that occur here. And basically, they suck in any unsuspecting migrating or feeding bats and kill them. Bats are also affected by electromagnetic frequencies. Sorry about that. Um, they, they tend to avoid radar installations. Uh, they exhibit adver adverse effects and heightened sen sensitivity, especially to ambient EMF exposures. Um, this can affect everything from orientation, feeding, migration, breeding, vigor, survivorship, and so on. And again, we go into considerable detail discussing this in, in our three-part paper and to a shorter extent in the paper from last year. Um, given the losses, estimated losses from white nose syndrome, pesticides, other diseases, blade collisions, habitat loss, radiation, and more, these losses are simply unsustainable. My wife and I haven't seen a bat, for example, at our place in Moosehead Lake for over 12 years. Uh, before that time, we take the dogs out at night with our headlamps, almost invariably every evening, 
moths and other insects would fly in front of the lights and the bats would come swooping down literally a foot from us and grabbing the, the moths right out in front of us. It was just quite spectacular. And same thing down in our former residence in Northern Virginia. We haven't seen, didn't see any bats there for, for well over a dozen years. So it's, it's, it's very frustrating. So what are, what are some of the things we can do? Um, what have I done to try to address bat collisions at wind turbines? Well, I chaired the Fish and Wildlife Service's 2011-2012 Wind Turbine Guidelines Drafting Committee. And I was pushing for a regulation a regulatory approach in this guidance that, amongst other things, we could uh, actually regulate and call for a, a, an increase in cut-in speed during peak back, bat migrations. Uh, colleague Ed Arnett and his team did a study in 2011 at Castleman Wind Energy Project in Pennsylvania, where they found by slightly increasing the cut-in speed of these turbines to a couple of miles per hour, it increased or it reduced the mortality at these facilities by up to 93%, which is pretty amazing. But the power losses were less than or about 1%, so they were pretty insignificant. Same could also benefit migratory birds. Nearly all members of our drafting committee wanted to see a regulatory approach for the guidelines, but unfortunately, uh, Interior Secretary uh, Ken Salazar rejected that, opting for a voluntary guideline. Uh, and so had we had that then, or even if we had it could implement it now, I think it would make quite a difference. American Wind Energy Association, an industry trade group, also tried the voluntary guidelines approach in 2015, but unfortunately it didn't work. Another option, that's to use what we call bat blasters or ultrasonic acoustic devices, UADs, which you put on the nacelles of the, of the uh, turbines, the, the top portion, I'll show you a picture in the next slide in a minute. Um, in a study done in, uh, in Texas, the overall bat fatalities were reduced by about 50% with reductions of up to 80% in some species. But this, this um, ultrasonic uh, uh, technology is still in the developmental stage. It's expensive, it's labor intensive. Every turbine is gonna need multiple UADs and it's still not reducing mortality to what I would say uh, is a significant uh, level. 50% mortality is still, that's pretty high. So the slide and uh, the photograph in the middle, that's the nacelle and those structures leaning over it are, are UADs, the acoustic devices. Um, there are several other options that we have tested in the past. One is blade feathering. So just think um, if I'm gonna rent uh, a Cessna 182 uh, and take it for a flight, I'm gonna need to pre-flight it, and I'm going to need to run up the engine to check the magnetos on that on that aircraft. So I run it up to about 1,700 RPMs, but I, I want to make sure that the blade, the pitch of the blade is such that it's not dragging me down the runway. So just like the airplane propeller, you change the pitch of a blade, uh, you alter it so you can, it stops cutting into the wind. Also, seasonal shutdowns have been tried, and there's been monitoring using uh, uh, um, radar where uh, the radar, uh, the, the monitoring can feather the blades, but these these opportunities have, have which have been tested have been only shown to have limited success, and basically, I think they're they're impractical. Um, like real estate, three most important things about buying a property: location, location, and location. So you want to select sites for for turbine facilities that are low risk. They are in developed areas or they are degraded sites. So like a local industrial site would be preferable. Um, mountaintops, um, forested habitats, not so. And you can see the slide in the bottom right of the uh, hoary bat below the, the wind turbine. That, uh, um, that facility is on a mountaintop and it's in a wooded habitat. So we wanna try to avoid those if we can. Um, if we did that, this could very likely reduce the, uh, the interactions with, with the turbines and the bats, and for that matter, with birds. So what did I do for Fish and Wildlife Service? What were some of my roles in trying to deal with, with uh, what was going on here? Well, um, one was to develop and implement steps to what we call avoid or minimize bird take. Taking is defined as the unpermitted, um, um, uh, 
loss, death, injury, or crippling loss of any protected migratory bird. We have over a thousand migratory birds protected by the act. Uh, these are species also potentially impacted by structures and, and uh, electrocutions. All migratory birds are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. This is a strict liability statute. It was passed in 1918, so it's been around for quite some time. Uh, much of my work, a number of my roles involve working with our uh, Office of Law Enforcement, with our interior solicitors, with Fish and Life Services, Ecological Services, with our migratory bird coordinators, with the Federal Aviation Administration, Federal Communications Commission, Department of Transportation, U.S. Coast Guard, and other environmentalists and contacts and industry reps and consultants. Again, what we're trying to do is what can we do to avoid or minimize take? Point out that a federal permit is required to possess a migratory bird in its parts. And the Migratory Bird Treaty Act currently has no provision for the accidental or incidental unintentional take of any protected migratory bird, uh, which would be killed in otherwise normal legal business practices and, and or normal personal activities. Uh, the U.S. Congress noted that the take of even one protected migratory bird is a violation of the statute and criminal penalties can be extensive. So working with law enforcement, um, basically they use the scientifically tested, peer-reviewed and published and reasonable we call conservation measures to avoid or minimize take which service staff and others and incorporated into the voluntary guidelines. So the Avian Power Line Interaction Committee 2006 guidance deals with, with electrocution avoidance. The Avian or the APLIC 2012 guidance deals with collision avoidance. So um, these are two sets of guidelines that are very important that I'll show you some others in just a minute. The ind industries, the, the perspective of law enforcement with the industry was the three E's. Educate the parties first, exchange information second, and lastly, if necessary, enforce the statute. While this guidance is voluntary, the companies understood that their failure to adopt any reasonable measures that had been agreed to by other industry actors that would be followed by predictable bird mortality did indeed place them at risk of being subject to prosecution for criminal uh, violations. The Department of Justice's basis was based on this, this uh, assumption. Uh, and they used it for misdemeanor and criminal prosecution under MBTA. Some of the fines that, that were implemented uh, were significant. Um, in the case of these three cases below, which I was involved, um, all the corporate executives and all three of the companies were put on probation for up to four years. They were criminally prosecuted and they were required to make significant, some significant improvements in their uh, the infrastructure. And uh, um, they had to had to uh, do a concerted effort to try to make improvements. Moon Lake Electric Cooperative was a small cooperative in Western Colorado, Eastern Utah, that um, was electrocuting uh, golden eagles. And in the bottom right of the slide is a picture, uh, a drawing of a golden eagle um, flying over two wires. One might be a phased wire, uh, one might be a ground wire. And uh, if they make a contact with those two wires, they can be electrocuted. Moon Lake um, was advised by our um, law enforcement agent and colleague, Leo Suazo, that they needed to make the improvements, uh, the changes to their infrastructure at their cooperative. Moon Lake blew Leo off. So they were criminally prosecuted. They were fined $100,000 for electrocuting Golden Eagles, and they were required to retrofit over a million dollars in, in structural improvements. So um, it kind of sent a really, uh, resounding message to many in the industry about uh, the importance of, of following what uh, needed to be done as far as avoiding or minimizing take. Uh, in 2009, Pacificor was uh, killing, um, um, electrocuting primarily golden eagles, if I remember correctly. Uh, and they were advised by law enforcement to make the changes. Uh, their company executives blew off law enforcement and they were criminally fined for ten and a half million dollars for electric eating birds. Now the settle agree settlement agreement was was quite a bit less, but it was still um, kind of a black mark on the on the company. And then in 2013, Duke Energy, um, Duke Wind Energy, uh, was fined a million dollars for for uh, killing 
protected migratory birds at wind turbines uh, in the West. So these, uh, these issues can, uh, can make a difference and they are certainly an eye opener for, for the industry. Um, however, I might mention that the whole process of take was completely overturned in late 2017. Trump's solicitor, uh, terrorist solicitor Giorgiani issued a legal opinion, what's called M37050, the so-called M opinion, uh, that stated that the Migratory Bird Treaty Act did not prohibit incidental take except in the case of birds that are illegally killed, called poached, or birds that were Ill, uh, illegally taken and imported in this country. Everything else was off the table. So I was invited to submit an affidavit in a combined Natural Resource Defense Council, National Audubon, at a lawsuit against the Interior Department uh, regarding my, my role uh, as a services lead for the Division of Migratory Bird Management and Dressing Structures when I was involved with them for 17 years. Uh, good news, August 2020, U.S. District Judge Valerie Caproni issued her legal opinion, vacating the Giordani M opinion and remanding her findings back to Interior Department for, for further action. So as a result of the court ruling, Fish and Wildlife Service published its final rule in October of 2021. That rule revoked the previous rule that, uh, of the Giordani opinion where uh, that had codified their legal opinion. Service now implements Migratory Bird Treaty Act, as it was previously done prior to the Giordani opinion. Incidental take is again prohibited, as it has been for over 100 years, and enforcement of the statute is applied with, with discretion. While some would argue that incidental or accidental take is unavoidable, it's still a violation of, of the statute, and permits for take under the statute are not provided through regulations. So to address take, whether you're a corporation or for that matter, an individual, uh, you wanna take all reasonable and practical steps to avoid or minimize mortality or injury to migratory birds and show a good faith effort to minimize these impacts. This is the message that I portrayed for 17 years when I worked for Fish and Wildlife Service. So for industry, these efforts include incorporating peer reviewed conservation measures, publish best management practices, recognize best available technologies. And these things are all spelled out in Fish and Wildlife Service guidelines. And just as a footnote here, law enforcement folks, special agents are reasonable. If you hit a bird while you're driving, if you unknowingly cut down a, a tree with an active bird nest in it, uh, I wouldn't expect you would see a, a law enforcement special agent showing up at your door. Uh, these are these are not priorities. There certainly can be problems, but but uh, not to worry. So, what are some of the things that we have available in the stuff that I worked on uh, that the Fish and Wildlife Service continues to to use and and implement that that are available? So, with communication towers, we recommend constructing constructing new towers that are unguide, unlit, monopole in construction, and um, are selected in, are planted, placed in degraded sites and co-located where you uh, can uh, install other antennas, um, ideally from other towers on, on a new tower so we don't put more towers out in the landscape. Use the minimum amount of lighting, uh, that which is recommended by the Federal Aviation Administration and that which is uh, required by the Federal Communications Commission. Power distribution lines. So here, these are the lines that that uh, come into our houses. Uh, so we suggest spacing wires so that large birds like golden eagles uh, don't connect between a phase-to-phase -phase or phase-to-ground wire, make a contact uh, a wrist or if it's a wet feather, feather tip, um, connect between the two wires and become electrocuted. Uh, same thing for transformers and capacitors. Transmission lines, uh, a lot of it is siting of these, these lines, proper places to minimize impacts. Also, placement of, of uh, alternate nesting sites, nesting sources for ospreys, golden eagles, and others. Industrial wind turbines, um, we recommend that they be sited in degraded habitats, ideally uh, those least impacting to birds and bats. And let's see if we can increase the cut-in speeds and, and monitor to validate if this indeed works or not, as, as uh, Arnett uh, at Castleman uh, documented with a significant increase in a reduction in, in collision. 
Building glass and lighting. There are a number of best management practices recommended by New York City Audubon, uh, Fatal, Light Aware Fatal Light Awareness Program in Toronto, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, San Francisco Audubon and others. So turn building lights off at night, down shield exterior lighting. There are a whole series of protocols of, of things to do here that, that can reduce uh, mortalities. And again, the collisions with windows is next to cats, the second largest source of, of mortality that we're aware of. Solar power towers. So this is a relatively new issue. Um, this tower down in the bottom right um, is about 400 and some feet high. Um, there are as many as 273,000 mirrors around these. These are mirrors about the size of a garage door opener, a gar garage door, sorry. Um, so they're very large. They beam the, uh, the radiation up to this power tower, creating very high temperatures of up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit or perhaps even more uh, to heat a fluid that then uh, runs a, um, a steam generator, which then produces electricity. Uh, there are not too many of these, but um, they are a real problem. Um, when my colleague, uh, Jill Birchall, who was our senior resident agent in charge for California of law enforcement, she was invited by the president of Ivanpah to go see the, the opening of the facility. And when, when they were there watching, a peregrine falcon came flying down and literally flew into the power tower and was just, it exploded from the, from the uh, it was fried basically. And so Jill asked me afterwards, she said, I didn't know what to do. Should I arrest the president on the spot? So this is, this is the problem. So a few things that, that um, I put together in a paper in, for 2016, um, suggesting things that needed to be done because I'm not sure they have a training protocol yet to, to, to deal with, with uh, uh, bird takes at these structures. So need to develop a credible peer reviewed monitoring protocol that systematically validates both bird and bat fatalities, uh, especially at these solar flux towers. We need to test and implement bird deterrent devices. These are devices that were published uh, particularly in the, the APLEX 2006 uh, electrocution avoidance um, document, as well as the 2012 collision avoidance. Uh, Reduce fatalities for birds and bats uh, using fencing, nets, perch deterrents, exclusionary devices, UV, UV reflective glass so the birds can actually see the mirrors uh, and not boink into them, uh, which some do. Suspend operations during peak bird and bat presence. Use trained dogs to detect carcasses. Conduct at least two years of daily searches and make results available to the public and to, to agencies. <clears throat> so these are, uh, some things we need to move forward, and I'm not sure where the, 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 the power tower industry is yet on this. <clears throat> so anyway, in addressing the issues, much of my work for Fish and Wildlife Service involved developing and fostering industry partnerships. So the Avian Power Line Inter Interaction Committee working with the electric utility industry was perhaps the most effective. I chaired the Communication Tower Working Group. This was a consortium of um, the major CTIA, PCIA, um, Verizon, T-Mobile, uh, AT&T, FCC, FAA, DOT, um, and um, biologists, uh, economicians, um, conservationists were trying to, to deal with, with uh, the, the lighting impacts at communication towers. Um, I served as a technical uh, scientific advisor on the Federal uh, Wind Energy Advisor Committee, founded and chaired the Bird Safe Glass Working Group, and I co-chaired the Interation C Seabird Working Group, so we won't go into that because Ed already mentioned that. We, um, I was involved in writing and implementing voluntary industry guidelines, for example, the 2013 communication tower guidance uh, that benefited both birds and bats, the 2013 bird safe glass guidelines. I co-authored the Avian Protection Plan APP guidance. This was a, a series of guidelines for each company to implement an APP specific to their needs and their, their utility where they um, would make a concerted effort uh, in writing of what they 
we're going to try to do to avoid or minimize, take, reduce mortality as best as possible. Then I co-authored the 2006 electrocution avoidance and the 2012 um, uh, collision avoidance documents for the industry. Also was uh, asked to help teach Avian Powerline Air Training Committee short courses. So we tried to teach the uh, industry reps how to deal with this. Um, gave invited presentations, the FAA, FCC, uh, you can read the slide, lots of others. Um, chaired the Wind Energy Guidelines Drafting Committee, um, drafted service offshore wind energy guidelines in 2013. And all, this, all these efforts were designed to preserve and maintain bird populations and avoid a minimized take. I would say the APLIC um, interaction, the APLIC guide, guidance was the most adopted, the most affected. The one that was most problematic that only some of the companies adopted were the wind energy guidelines. So again, one of my most meaningful efforts was working with Dr. Joel Gearing, um, who is the principal investigator for a project on Michigan State Police communication towers uh, throughout the state. Um, basically, the state police put in a bunch of towers, 26 or so, without approval from the FCC, and then some birds were noted uh, being killed at a tall tower in the Upper Peninsula, the Keweenaw Peninsula, and uh, the um, Michigan chapter of National Wildlife Federation was going to sue the uh, state of Michigan for not uh, dealing with takes. So we decided, we negotiated and agreed that uh, we'll put $200,000 rather than put it in a lawsuit, let's put it towards a research effort. So Joel um, did some marvelous work, a couple of years study, and uh, basically found that the steady red burning lights, that L810 light that I showed you in a few slides back, was, uh, was most injurious and if we could get lighting to be replaced with flashing red lights at night and white strobes in the daytime, it would make a real difference. So um, the FAA gave us a, a, a lighting variance to change out the lights on, on some of the towers. It's called for concubuity studies um, for pilots. So make sure that they can see them at night. And then once this all worked, then the FCC adopted this, this um, lighting change out uh, through rulemaking. So again, the steady red lights are, are, are fatal, as are, for that matter, steady white lights uh, where those are, are found at other locations. So in the, in the study that Joel coordinated and that Curlinger and I um, co-authored, we estimated that the new lighting regime would reduce mortality nationwide by around 50%. So this is, this is a big deal. So that was pretty exciting. And just to point out that all our voluntary guidelines that produced within the Fish and Wildlife Service was based on the best available peer-reviewed science. And admittedly, there's a lot of science in these guidelines. So maintaining mitigation measures um, could be adopted. And then I would say probably all the stuff that I've talked about tonight could be used if it's not being already. But unfortunately, many administrations and federal and state agencies and affected industries seem to lack the political will and they may not be getting the appropriate direction and guidance or in the case of industry, they just don't wanna reduce those massive corporate profits or they just don't, simply don't care. So we need to change that paradigm. And if we don't, if this mortality continues, then this is gonna to lead to more birds and bats being listed under the Endangered Species Act, which could result in some birds being extirpated or even ex going extinct. Um, and frankly, it's a colossal waste of taxpayer funds when we have, frankly, priorities of, of um, equal, if not greater magnitude, such as climate change. So the public needs to raise a loud and concerted voice pressure lawmakers and, and lawmakers and agencies and the affected industries to implement the will of the people that is to save species and habitats. The birds and bats clearly need champions um, more so than they have now. Meanwhile, uh, there need to be some changes in what I call the elephant in the room. This is addressing the impacts from, from electromagnetic radiation from EMF. The FCC has been dealing for now about 35 years with an out-of-date technology based primarily on ther thermal heating, which is now inapplicable. 1985, they created their original 
guidelines based on thermal heating. They did some revisions in 1996, but they are still not, um, haven't been changed. The problem now is extremely low levels of radiation, like I mentioned in that Litovich study, one ten thousandth the radiation level coming from a cell phone is causing genetic variation, uh, in this case, deaths um, in chicken embryos and certainly in, in other organisms, probably affecting all wildlife. Um, and we need, to, we need to make some changes. The FCC just doesn't seem to want to budge. They were sued by the American Bird Conservancy in 2008 uh, over the uh, impacts of cell towers on migratory birds and their failure to, to uh, implement NEPA. FCC lost that lawsuit on appeal, um, but um, I haven't seen really any significant change in their regulations. They continually continue to categorically exclude um, cell tower placement uh, unless it deals with a, a federal endangered species. Um, in 2020, the Environmental Health Trust filed a lawsuit against the FCC, which they won. Uh, the FCC had failed to basically notify uh, the public about its how it developed its RF standards, and they've failed to respond to, to uh, the issues of environmental harm, everything from, from mutations, DNA breaks, uh, reproductive failures, cancers, and so on. And again, in this case, uh, we haven't seen um, any real change since they they uh, lost that lawsuit uh, as far as, as changing their, their thermal regulatory, or changing their RF standards and, and dealing with this issue. So it's, it's frustrating. From my perspective, we need radiation standards for wildlife. They are currently non-existent. Uh, with the 5G realm coming into play now, this is even more important. These are one millimeter or so size waves, which resonate particularly with, with uh, small organisms like insects and small uh, reptiles and amphibians and so on. Um, and uh, we need to get these, get these going. And I haven't seen any, any uh, indication yet that, that, that that's happening. Uh, there's no question these challenges are daunting. We need some leadership that will, will support wildlife and deal with these challenges. Um, and they also obviously impact us. And I think we need to, we need to address them now. There's very little time left uh, um, in, in what's going on. So as a parting thought, um, hopefully the ongoing efforts or the lack thereof will not leave us with this image below of this endangered whitetail sea eagle that was, that was killed. Um, we each have a stake in protecting our wildlife heritage. Wildlife desperately need our help. As friend and wildlife biologist Doug Chadwick said in his uh, book, Four Fifths of Grizzly, do unto ecosystems as you would have them do unto you. So with that, in closing, uh, I would say we should favor conservation of wildlife and the public trust. Uh, we need to develop industries, including renewables that are bird, bat, and habitat friendly. And we need to use informed decision based on adequate environmental assessment and sound science. So with that, uh, any questions? And Ed, how do you want to deal with this? Do you want to just read them from the chat box or like we've got quite a number? Um, yes, so I've made some notes along the way. I'm not looking at, now I'm looking at the chat box um, and I can go from my notes without even reading the questions probably. Uh, that would probably be a little bit quicker, um, but we can see what happens. Uh, um, so somebody asked early on about uh, military aircraft. We live over in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, there's an air base there, a lot of F-35s, moving structures, if you will. But mm -hmm. do, you have, do you have anything to say about sort of no the noise pollution aspect or any other aspect of uh, heavy air traffic uh, and military air traffic in particular, I guess? Yeah, we're, we're in a military operations area uh, at Moosehead Lake. So we've had a ongoing problem with F-16s flying over. Um, a few years back, they were literally flying over the treetops and um, I didn't see any birds killed, but I'm sure they were uh, from the shock waves just from flying, flying so close. So we contacted the uh, Commandant um, uh, at the air base, uh, I think it's up in Presque Isle, and said, look, you're supposed to be flying at least 1500 feet above, above ground level. 
and this was clearly at treetop level. Um, it stopped for a while and then we've had um, some more operations, but they're not coming quite as close, but it's still, that's a, that's a problem, yes. I, I, I've sort of lost track, but I know that out in the, um, on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington, there were, there were big issues that people were concerned about with growler aircraft as kind of a yep. using, using radar systems to help direct aircraft, I guess. Uh, or, or yeah, we have, a, we have a whole section of that in our 2021 paper about, about the Olympic National Park and the, and the, the growler um, um, jets and, and the radars and the, the concerns in a wilderness area. And rather than discussing it, I would just say uh, the paper is open access so you can get it online and, and uh, um, review that. Uh, someone asked about Starlink as an option for safe wireless service alternative. And you want to, you want to address sort of the issue of, of the, the unfortunate constellations of ever, 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 ever increasing uh, <laughs> uh, constellation or supernova of satellites. That we satellite, have. Yeah, satellites everywhere. And the problem with, Starlink, like with so many others, is that uh, you have more radiation impacting, coming down, impacting us and impacting wildlife. And so we've already got a huge problem with electrosmog, just 24 seven, we're being bombarded with, with EMF and, uh, you know, not able to do really anything about it other than maybe live in a, in a, a bubble, which is not realistic, some sort of a, a radiation shield. Um, but uh, this is just another issue that uh, uh, we have to face with, with um, you know, our growing communication technology and, and, and needs. And uh, um, I'm not sure I have an answer because, uh, you know, Musk is sending up, he's, he wants to send another God knows how many thousands of satellites up there uh, to, to create more coverage. Uh, so it's um, damned if you do and damned if you don't kind of scenario. There's a, uh, we had an early group uh, formed that kind of brought a lot of this to the public light called, um, acronym was GUARDS, Global Union Against Radiation Deployment from Space. And we have a web primitive, very primitive website, um, stop, uh, global, stopglobalwifi.org. Um, so people might want to look at that. And, and there's some early stuff on this issue. And the issue, and with the satellites issues, not only the, the RF or the, the radiation, but also uh, a lot of the fuels that are being used. And, and what that does to the atmosphere and how that relates to climate change as well. Um, question here about bird strikes uh, on, and bird window collisions. Are they, this person has heard, are they less of a concern uh, for higher building floors? Is there any truth to that? Well, the higher, the taller the building, the more likelihood of bird strikes, but you can, even at single story buildings like uh, residents, um, we have, I, I put a, in that early slide, a picture of, uh, our little um, bird deterrent devices, we basically put um, parachute cord about every two inches uh, along uh, a, a wooden holder that dangles down the window. We had previously put Kaleidoscape and, and uh, uh, some of these other UV um, decals on the windows, but it didn't seem to be working very effectively. This thing has made quite a difference. So, um, but yes, you can have them all the way up and of course, when one of the things that during the celebration of, of the, um, the Twin Towers and when they, the celebration of lights, they were beaming those spotlights um, during 9-11 uh, celebrations, um, you know, years after the fact uh, that were basically birds were coming in and flying down in a vortex and, and dying. So we, we encourage them to, if they're going to do it, just do it for a limited part of the evening and then turn them off. Don't leave them on all night which New York City did, uh, but um, huge, huge problems. So um, this is a whole science in and of itself. Um, and there, there's a lot of technology, uh, technological changes out there that, that are recommended. Federal government, uh, that was part of my role, was to rec recommend guidance that, that GSA would implement it for all federal buildings, which they're beginning to do. So um, it's, it's a real problem. Okay, so the, uh, the the bat signal is bad for crooks and bats. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there's a question here about bird feeders, uh, and that's pretty probably pretty common. Uh, I, I enjoy feeding birds from my backyard. I ponder the trade-off: the black oil sunflower seeds are grown commercially somewhere, 
substituting industrial agriculture for natural habitats that support insects and birds. Do you have any thoughts about this dichotomy? And of course, you probably have thoughts about should we be feeding birds from bird feeders anyway? Yeah, I mean that that is a that is a conundrum because um, this is a this is a huge market. We're you know we're spending billions of dollars per year feeding birds. Um, the problem too right now with with avian influenza is that you you don't want to attract a lot of birds to one source because if if some of them are infected, they will pass on that viral infection to others. And with the transmutation, trans, um, transference to other species, I mentioned here in Maine, they, they said several hundred harbor seals had been found dead from, from uh, H5N1. Uh, and a couple of humans uh, have apparently picked it up, Cambodia and China, um, from uh, ostensibly birds. So um, yeah, you have to be very careful on the feeding issue. I know we feed birds, but you gotta clean your feeders regularly and uh, make sure it's fresh seed in there and any indication that any of birds are are sick or or dead then stop feeding okay um someone writes in they're they're electrically sensitive and also concerned about emf effects on wildlife um points out that fiber optics <coughs> for the premises is cheaper generally use glass and plastic using more common materials than cell towers and wi-fi stuff um, and um, do, do, wants wants to know if if you you know uh, if you do it underground you can you can you can provide internet service without you know increasing chances of collisions. Um, do you, do you promote fiber to the premises uh, when speaking to different levels of government and other NGOs? And I know that Blake has some you know strong thoughts about this, but I don't know what you, you know, if you've thought about this much. You know. Well, again, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. We had fiber optic in Virginia and it was very reliable. Um, and yeah, you're, it's, it's a lot of infrastructure, but you're not impacting birds or bats for that matter. Um, so um, it, it certainly would be better in my opinion than satellites. Um, and and or cell towers or whatever. Um, but that's one of the issues we're facing here in Maine is the challenge, uh, uh, how do we get broadband and internet and whatever out to the communities? And uh, um, they're talking about putting in fiber optic uh, in our neck of the woods on Moosehead Lake, but I don't know when that's gonna happen. Um, are there um, newer innovative wind turbine blade designs that are less harmful. And I know, you know, with our work with uh, water turbines is certainly are, you know, some turbines that are considered more fish friendly than others. They're not in much use, I'll say, but I don't know if they're, if they're doing the same thing with wind turbines or not. Yes, there are. And shake turbines are one example. They're much smaller. They're not the industrial scale that we have with these, you know, turbines that take up um, the three bladed um, industrial turbines that take up, you know, size of a football field or more in, in uh, rotor swept area. Small, but you get a number of them and they basically, they resonate, wind blows, they resonate and they produce electricity. And uh, it's a tried and true technology, uh, just hasn't taken off. And because it's not the scale of industrial turbines, um, it's hard to compete to produce the, the, the uh, megawattage of electricity that, that an industrial turbine will produce as opposed to the needs for you know thousands of these to do the same thing, but for for you know uh, uh, residential use and maybe small scale industrial, yeah, it has a real real option. It just unfortunately hasn't taken off. And so could you say that say again the name of the, they're okay. called shake turbines. Shake okay. Shake S H A K E. Oh, shake okay. All right. So they they shake in the wind. Oh, okay. Um, someone talks about, you know, putting all the little stick-ons on their windows to deter birds and, um. Yeah, Kaleidoscape and Window Alert, um, they have to, you have to have an awful lot of them. Uh, they have to be pretty, pretty close together for the birds to see. They've got a, basically a UV filter in them. And then when sunlight hits them, the, we can't see in ultraviolet, but birds can. And mm -hmm. so the, the, the concept is they see it and so they, they avoid, or at least in theory, avoid hitting the window. We had them 
on our place at Moosehead Lake, but they just weren't working. So we decided to try this parachute cord um, option. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seemed to be working. It's so far working out very well. Okay. Um, Roger Wheeler has a question, not about the, the structures we've been talking about, but the, the, uh, but other huge structures. Uh, does anyone talk about the impacts of dams and, and artificial flow regulation on bird populations and their food supplies? For example, cascading large dams on the Angara River in Siberia eliminated black fly larva and thus black flies a food source for birds. Um, I have trouble scrolling down to read this. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Sebago Lake, before the mid-80s, when the DEP started rigid water, rigid water level regulation, upper beach vegetation was very diverse, plants and grasses. The bird population was too. Many flowering plants uh, that drew many hummingbirds and beach birds. Now the upper beach has no vegetation and a few birds. The discussion that dams and flow regulation, along with um, um, uh, reduced nutrient supplies to marine ecosystems as well. Um, so anyway, um, the, uh, the gist of the question is, have, have are, are people in your sphere thinking about this sort of issue, I guess? And the answer uh, is yes. And, and uh, good, good contact would be Alex Hoare in Amherst, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Alex is also former fish and wildlife, fisheries and wildlife biologist with Fish and Wildlife Service in, in Region 5 and um, Northeast. He's retired, but he's continuing to do work on dam flows, and he is a font of information uh, about these issues. And I can certainly provide you his contact that you can pass on if, if that would help. Yeah. And, and I if Alex have, is okay with that. Yeah, I, I have Alex's information and, and, and I know Roger. And, and, and I'll point out that we actually in the, I think miscellaneous page of our web library, which is our electronic library at f1b.org, Somewhere down towards the bottom, we have a very in-depth section on um, artificial flows, and and I know Friends of Sebago has a has has a lot of that literature out there, and a lot of it's older literature, and it's important to, to realize that as we, you know, all are hearing about you know green energy and whatnot, and everyone's getting electric cars, that pretty much there is no there is no green big hydro energy. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a fallacy and that's where, you know, anyway, um, scrolling down here quickly and, uh, and a lot of people thanking you for your presentation, which was, which was really excellent. Um, blah, 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 cats. Uh, let's see. I'm not, uh, oh, this is, oh, here's a better way. I, I just made, the, made this big on my screen. Uh, okay. Now I got to figure out how to scroll down. I think I think you you've got a record record attendance for any of our presentations, Al. So thank you. It makes you a crowd pleaser. Uh, <laughs> I hope. So, so. I see Blake has got her hand up. <laughs> okay, well, ask Blake something. I can't. I can't. Uh, it's this beyond me. I'm seeing all this all this chit chat about Elon Musk on here. You know, it's like <laughs> <laughs> ask a question. Ask a question. We know Musk sucks. You know, so, so <laughs> import okay. Al. Yeah. Yeah, ask, go, ask, go Blake. Hit your picture unmute or something if, if you can do that. Um, or... Mute. There. Got me? Got you. No, okay. That's great. okay. We're talking about Elon Musk. That's like falling down a rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> great talk, Al. Great talk. Uh, for, for those that are on this call, I can uh, guarantee you that uh, we only scratch the surface with what this gentleman understands about protecting wildlife. He's a genius when it comes to that. And he described himself as the junior author on our papers, but um, we could not have done this without him. He's our policy wonk and knows the federal law like the back of his hand and really kept us on, on, on target for our end goal, which was to um, really get into policy issues. So it was, you were, you were certainly not the junior author Al, by any stretch of the imagination. Anyway, I do have a question in here. Um, is anybody talking about um, trying to regulate away from these massive bladed turbines and going to vertical axis designs? You, you, they can be much smaller. You can get them off of ridge lines. You can get them in valley areas. You can get them out of the oceans. Um, you, can, you can get rid of all, all, almost all the barotrauma and everything else that goes along with it. Is anybody doing anything with that, Al? 
and then I'll, I'll, I'll unmute myself. A, a little bit, but unfortunately, uh, the industry, China is producing, uh, from my understanding, the vast majority of these, these industrial turbines um, we're starting to pick up, but because of its, its scales of economy, I think is the argument that the industry uses. So they just don't seem to be willing to want to downsize and try something that, yeah, you're going to need more of it, but it's much safer and doesn't create the problems, the impacts that these mega turbines do. But I just haven't seen any traction. Um, when, when we were, when the Wind Energy Federal Advisory Committee was meeting, I do remember a discussion uh, by one of the, uh, the invitees about some of the options. And they, he, he talked about uh, um, some of these smaller uh, turbine uh, uh, choices that are available. But again, it really didn't resonate because the, the major corporations, uh, Ibadrola is one of the big, big pushers here. They're into uh, industrial scale. And of course, the, the model has already been set across the pond in Europe on both land based and offshore wind there. And these are, these are these huge turbines. So as much as it would be wonderful if we could you know, use the safer, smaller turbines, I just don't see that happening with the direction we're headed. Okay, that's that's too bad. Uh, Quinnipiac University, for instance, has about oh, eight or nine or 10 of them on the campus. And in, in so many ways, uh, the way people headed, um, headed up efforts to uh, get universities to uh, go into more responsible investing for their, um, you know, for their, uh, uh, their, their very large um, investment holdings. Um, it would be lovely if there's an environmentalist out there that uh, would, you know, spearhead this effort to put more um, uh, uh, smaller wind turbines, um, you know, because they're shielded, they don't, they don't hurt birds. They, I mean, they're, they're really, they look, they're not even all that ugly. Um, get the universities to, uh, to put them on the campuses and, and create some sort of, um, uh, not not to be too glib about it, some wind under the sails of, of the vertical axis designs <laughs> to try to, uh, you know, people don't even know that these things exist. I mean, unless you're really involved with the technology of looking at things, which you and I are, um, people don't even know that this, is a, that, that this is an option. You could even write it into zoning regulations. The towns would only allow vertical axis designs, for instance, before, you know, big wind uh, uh, corporations come knocking to, you know, put, put uh, uh, things on, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, farmland that's not being used and farmers that want to make transitions into green energy. I mean, there's a way to, uh, you well know, there's a way to go about it. But what we need to do, I think, is, uh, you know, just figure out what that avenue is. Um, seems seems a worthy effort among our many worthy efforts, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Year, year, years, years ago, I remember a, a number of Danish designs that were vertical, like, and, and actually years ah. ago, also, we had a gentleman speak, Alexander Gorloff, who designed a uh, an underwater turbine for for really minimally impacting fish population. It was kind of a yeah. vertical. It could be mounted vertically or horizontally, but kind of an open helical design. Probably wouldn't be as good for birds. But uh, again, thinking about getting rid of all these big dams and having a whole bunch of these little guys in the river, yeah. the, the had amount to having a bunch of boulders out there, you know, and, yeah. and not so much effect. Um, Nancy has a hand up. Uh, Nancy Gland. I don't know how to. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. A gallon, gallon, gland, gland is proper. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, I'm, I was really concerned when I read in the paper recently that there's a um, solar array going up in Warren that's going to cover 675 acres. And uh, the planning board approved it. And after they approved it, the, the they realize the whole everybody involved realized that their regulations, their ordinances were not up to date. They did not, they did not, they weren't prepared for this. And so they put a moratorium for any further um, uh, uh, approvals on solar farms, but they can't, they don't think that they can do anything about this one. And yet, I mean, 675 acres. That sounds like a lot of dead birds to me. And this is a this is a passive, uh, just the the angled solar panels. Is that what it is? As far as I know, there's not a lot of description about it. So I 
I'm just assuming that it is. I mean, to, in, in order to require that much acreage, I would think so. Well, the problem with, with these panels is that birds like common loons will mistake it for water. I know. And, yeah. land and of course, either get killed or they can't take off. Um, and so there are some things that can be done, uh, some deterrence. I, I talk about this a little bit in my paper from 2016, but, but um, yeah, it's, a, it's another tough one because we, we, need to, we need to ramp up our renewable use, but we need to, in the same token, make it you know, bird and bat and, and wildlife and habitat friendly. And that's a, that's a tough nut to crack. Well, the, the town, I think what this is, is an example of how towns are not prepared for the industrial ramping up that's going on. And so they don't have the ordinances in place, they don't have the information in place, they don't have the impacts. That is, does it, is they have to have an environmental impact statement to do this? They should, yeah. Um, uh, I would think so. I mean, it's a... Yeah especially if there's any any federal funding or if a federal permit is required or if it's on any federal property that that kicks in national environmental policy act and they have to do a NEPA review and that includes uh, uh environmental assessment um so but if it's on private property or state property then that's a different story and i'm not sure that, what the, okay that's it that's what i was wondering what kicks that in okay so probably not because it's not mentioned in the article. Well, if it doesn't, if it's not on federal property or have a federal permit or federal money is involved, then that federal nexus doesn't kick in. Oh, federal money might be involved because there's been a lot of federal money ramp to ramp these. It things sure up. has, yeah. The the uh, infrastructure bill, if it's money from there, then that's a different oh. story. Oh, I see. I think it is. Wait a minute. Well, they don't really say it's 125 million to 150 million dollar project, but they don't say where the money's coming from, but I'll bet, I'll bet there's federal money. So what can a citizen do? You can petition um, under NEPA um, for, uh, and I guess this would be Department of Energy uh, to, to uh, <clears throat> petition them to, to, do, to imp, uh, implement NEPA and, and do an environmental assessment of that site. Um, under the National Environmental Policy Act. And that, that allows the public to participate, public to comment, um, and um, can, can result in scoping sessions and public meetings and, and testimony and so on. And- uh, Would that be up uh, to the town to do that? Not as private citizen. It, no, it, have to, it would have to be through, through Department of, Federal Department of Energy. I mean, but the town, the, the city would, the, the town would have to petition. Well, private citizens could as well, but yeah, it would be helpful. You're if not going to have. The, you're not going to be listened to as a private citizen. I, I, I think. I think your issue points to a common problem, whether it's around, you know, uh, Wi-Fi or cell towers, or whether it's large developments of any kind. Is that a lot of these things can be um, uh, steered or directed, at least, if not stopped by the proper ordinances, but we're not very good at writing and enacting ordinances ahead of time. And yep. usually, usually it takes one of these situations to get people concerned enough to finally sit down and do that. Um, someone did write in and, and suggest that, at least in Maine, that um, within the state regulation of solar farms is, is um, uh, based on size of the development. So, and, and it's regulated by the DEP. So, you know, there's probably gonna be a threshold size at which more review is required. Just like in any town, uh, development of a certain size is going to go from the building, you know, codes enforcement officer up to a site plan review level. Oh, okay, so, okay. Okay, so I got another question uh, here Thank from, you. from uh, it's like uh, Ed, uh, whoop, Ed Dominguez here. Thank you. Thank you, Al, for a great presentation. I'm out here in Seattle, Washington. I work for the Seward Park Audubon Center, and I lead many bird and bat walks. Fifteen years ago or so, I remember reading a study about wind turbines actually rupturing 
eardrums of bats. And that's some information I give out in terms of the negative impact of wind turbines, turbines on bats. Is that still an issue or is it more, as you mentioned, the lung uh, rupturing? I wanna make sure I'm giving out accurate info uh, to my uh, participants. That's actually the first I've heard about eardrums being ruptured, but that doesn't surprise me that the bigger issue uh, is the barotrauma where the, the pressure gradients are also in this case, causing the lungs to collapse and the bats are, if they're not also hit by the turbine blade, uh, it can still disable them and then they're either killed or, or immobilized uh, and ultimately will die. But um, eardrum one, I, I'll have to do some, some digging on that one. That's, thank you for raising that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so Al, I think I, I think we're going to kind of close this up now. I, I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. You know, we we actually people don't know, but I asked you to do this like a, a year or two ago, and, and so <laughs> sometimes it takes a while to get our speakers, and uh, but we always we always get our man, you know, so or or woman. So um, I, I've got one. La I'll close with one last question, which is someone someone had. So now that you're retired. Is there someone else in the service that has taken on your role? I, we won't ask whether they're as effective or not, but is there someone else that's doing what you're doing? Yes, and that is uh, one of them. One of the the main players is Joelle Gehring, Dr. Gehring. I mentioned her. She was the the principal investigator for the Michigan State Police study, um, and uh, she after that actually was hired by the FCC as their only wildlife biologist on staff in the entire agency. And then uh, she more recently came over to Fish and Wildlife Service. I had recommended to our assistant director that, uh, Jerome, you really need to hire Joelle. <laughs> and they did. And uh, so she has taken over uh, a number of my roles, uh, my former roles um, with Fish and Wildlife Service with Migratory Bird Division. Um, and uh, Leslie Cordova is another one who's taken over some of my applic roles, applic uh, issues. So we've got their their people carrying on, carrying the torch forward. That's Great. good news. Great. Well, thank you, um, <clears throat> Theodora. Just noted. If you want more information on wildlife effects of RF, um, ehtrust.org, environmentalhealthtrust.org. Um, we have a main coalition to stop smartmeters.org. Uh, we've got a lot of wildlife stuff there. A lot of information out there. Um, so thank you again, Al. We appreciate that. Reminder to everyone that thanks to Martin McDonough here, uh, our technical advisor, um, we will uh, should have this posted here on our website uh, within a couple of days or so. And that'll go to the homepage of friendsofmarinebay.org or f1b.org. Scroll down on the right under education. You'll see a link to speaker series um, um, uh, videos. And Marge Friesen here is, has another website address for you. Oops, I just went off my screen for uh, for looking at wildlife science stuff. If you go to the chat room quickly, you'll see it. So um, thank you again, Martin. Thank you, Al. And thank you all for coming and hope to see some of you yeah, April 12th well. and uh, learn about who we're walking on, you know, or, or listen to who we're walking on out there. Thanks. Bye-bye.